by confession of faith, repeat after me, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better. After having heard the word of faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 is our foundational text for this lesson. Uh, we're in the midst of our uh, family boot camp, Christian family boot camp, and we're in our fourth division. Verse 24 says, that, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains ascended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. We've established already that Jesus is saying that if you will hear and do what the Word of God says do, then you can storm-proof your life because the storms of life do come, but your house don't have to crumble because the storms come. If you do hear and do what the Word of God says do, you can ensure your life against the storms. You can be sure that your, storm, your life will stand. In this fourth division, we're dealing with communication. And dealing with communication, we first talked about trust because if I cannot trust you, why even talk to you? Then we dealt with, uh, after trust, the forgiveness factor that I have to learn to forgive. Following forgiveness, remember, said that I have to forgive you, but I don't have to trust you. And so a lot of people have that confused, and we cleared that up. Then uh, the agreement factor, that the reason I want to press through this and learn how to communicate is because I value agreement. Communication in its simplest definition is uh, discussion with the intent to agree so that we can reach a place and a point of agreement. Now, in this communication, we've been dealing with uh, the dynamics of it. I want you to go with me in your Bibles now and um, uh, go to um, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We talked about the, uh, the dynamics of the conversational moment, the scope of the conversational moment, that it is the verbal dialogue, and it's dynamic because it sets the stage for interaction. It sets the stage where on a forum for the exchange of ideas and intimacies and instructions. And so it must be valued. We must value the conversation moment and not take it lightly. And since most, po most people don't understand the conversational dynamics, they have poor uh, hearing or listening skills. And we talked about that in our last lesson together. But now today we really want to focus on becoming very serious about this uh, communication point, the, the communication moment, dialoguing with others, become very serious about it because if we do not communicate uh, it could be devastated number one it could cause a disconnection in the relationship and the misunderstandings go unresolved if we don't talk this thing out and we don't uh, reach at a point of agreement and resolution then what will happen is we'll disconnect you may still live in the same house you may still be on the same job but you'll disconnect and uh, you know, uh, uh, based on that disconnection uh, that uh, misunderstanding never, never, never is resolved. Number two, the second devastation that happens when I don't communicate is that the parties may resort to surrogate communication partners. In other words, they start trying, they start to find, uh, you know, comfort in talking to somebody else, and that sets the stage for an affair. The third uh, devastation is there's a forfeiture of the blessing of agreement because there is no forum set where we can reach agreement. That's why we have to learn to talk. Everybody say that we have to learn to talk to each other. All right, now there are some game rules. There are some, there are some rules for talking with each other, and the Bible is really clear. Two points today. Point number one is the, the dynamic pursuit of correct and effective communication. The dynamic pursuit of uh, uh, correct and effective communication. And the second point is the deliberate changes for effective communication. The deliberate changes, what changes must be made. What changes must be made. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, you will be amazed as we'll read some scripture today that um, you'll be amazed that uh, how the Bible talks about, uh, it, it teaches us to monitor ourselves in how we talk to others. Verse, uh, what did I tell you, Philippians chapter? What did I tell you? Ephesians. Ephesians 4 and what? All right, Ephesians 4, 29. Hurry, 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 hurry. There it is. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, uh, out of your mouth, uh, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. 
So the Bible is teaching us here, it's telling us to be cautious on what you say and let no corrupt, defaming communication come out your mouth. But what you say ought to be that which edifies, builds others, others up. In that it's teaching me this uh, implies that it's important that I understand I just shouldn't say the first thing that comes to my mind. Amen. 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 All right, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. We're looking now as we begin to approach this, we're looking at the principles for sensible communication moments. The Bible wants us to be sensible in our communicating. So it says don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. And that's normally a product of being impulsive, saying the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't do that. Don't do that. Amen. <laughs> All right, now, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, here we are, here we have uh, another uh, exhortation. Verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every, mo every, every man. So I'll know how. I need to know how to talk to you. In that it tells me I need to know how to talk to you means I just can't talk to you any kind of way. If I need to know how, there's some things I probably need to know about you so I'll know how to talk to you. Now, I have to put a disclaimer on this part of the message that we're about to get into. Go to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27. Here's the disclaimer. Uh, you will have the temptation when you hear the, lesson, the, 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 the next part of this lesson to judge others and to use the information that I'm about to give you to establish your superiority over them when you get ready to converse with them. But this, what I'm about to tell you, we're going to look at some personality deficits because I hear the way I hear, I respond the way I respond because everything is filtered through my personality deficits. You get saved with deficits and we bring those deficits into the kingdom of God. Eradicating my deficit is not a criteria for being saved. Amen. In other words, he saves me, he'll receive me to the kingdom just like I am. Amen. And you ought to be glad about that. So I'm not required to, uh, to be in a mature state in order to be saved. But if I will walk with him and do the things that the scripture says do, I will arrive at the place of maturity and eliminate the deficits, know how to override the deficits. But initially, I'm going to bring the king into the kingdom of God all of my deficits. I'm going to talk about some personality deficits, and you will be tempted to judge the people around you and say, mm-hmm, that's her, mm-hmm, that's him. You follow me? But that's not the purpose of the lesson. The purpose of the lesson is not, <laughs> is not uh, so you can judge others, but so that you can see yourself and make corrections in yourself and not psychoanalyze others. Amen. amen. I need a better amen than that. All right, all right. It's, it's, it's going to get, get pretty stick, pretty, pretty tough in here in a minute. All right. But, but we're going to be all right. Everybody said we're going to be all right. all right. All right, Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 27 says, He that hath knowledge spared his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. So he that, a person who's of knowledge picks his words carefully. So when I have the knowledge of who you are, your character makeup, I'm going to pick my words more carefully when I talk to you. I'm going to pick my words more carefully when I speak. Amen. Amen. Your enthusiasm overwhelms the brother. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Per first personality that we're going to look at is the super sensitive personality. The super sensitive personality. And this is a person who is easily offended, quickly suspects others of unfair treatment, without significant proof, jumps to conclusions without proof. They're missing something they believe somebody stole it. <laughs> Amen. It is difficult for people who are super sensitive to make tough love decisions because they are so sensitive about how everybody perceives things. It's difficult for them to make decisions. All right? Now, in this, I'm going to talk about the adjustments the person needs to make and the adjustment you need to make if you're dealing with somebody like this. You follow me? Uh, but, but, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want you to just start judging folk. But I know you will. 
but I'm trying to help you. All right, super sensitive. Now, this is me. I'm a super sensitive person. Super sensitive. That's me. I'm, I'm super sensitive. Easily offended. Yeah. I'm easily offended. And if I lose something, I think somebody stole it from me. All right, now. So now, uh, um, here is the adjustments that this person needs to make so that this deficit does not dominate and destroy relationships. Number one, I am, you cannot be impulsive. This person must not be impulsive. You must learn to take that first thought that come to your mind and set that one on the shelf. Because that's the thought that, that is birthed out of your super sensitivity. Now, it may be right, but you can't trust it. Number two, second adjustment you need to make is you need to, you need to give others the benefit of the doubt. You have to discipline yourself to give others the, those, uh, you, if you're super sensitive, you got to give others the benefit of the doubt. They, they may not have meant it that way. Amen. You got to tell yourself they may not have meant it that way. Now, they may have, but you can't, but you know, you're super sensitive, you got to tone that thing down, bring it back and say, they may not have, see, I got this thing. I, I'm going to give you enough rope to hang yourself. Where it's undeniable, because my, a lot of my kids say, you know, Daddy, they're they doing this and this. I said, I understand that, and I am super sensitive. And they, you call, could be right. You know, they was talking about you at the, at the, at the, at the uh, 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 beauty shop, and I'm one of our members in there heard them, and they on staff, da, da, da. I said, okay, no problem, no problem, no problem. You didn't hear it directly. I didn't hear it directly. I can't judge it. Now, I'm going to give them enough rope, and they will hang themselves. God's got my back. I can afford to do that. No weapon formed against me going to prosper. But my super sensitivity is not going to cause me to make the mistake. All right. All right. Now, if you're dealing with a super sensitive person, here's how, you, here's, here's how you have to deal with them. You must apologize upon perceived offense. If they get offended, you got to go and apologize. Don't try to talk to them. I just go and apologize. <laughs> Secondly, compliment them often. They need it. In discussion, help them focus on the facts and not feeling. Number two, second personality, is the super spiritual personality. Super spiritual personality. These are the saints who escape reality, <laughs> hiding behind the convenience of spiritual rhetoric. The landlord says, your bill, your, your rent is due. Well, the, Jesus paid it all. Jesus, Jesus, he paid it all. Jesus paid it. <laughs> These people will speak in scattered, disconnected phrases to avoid confrontation. Now, if you are a super spiritual person, then here's, how, here's the adjustment you need to make. You need to remind yourself that the natural order is first. And with spiritual wisdom, handle your situation. All right? Now, here's how you deal with a super spiritual person. Don't get into a scriptural or spiritual debate with them. Number two, if you're dealing with a super spiritual person and they're all out there spooking and everything, you have to impose situational resolutions. You can say, okay, Jesus paid it all, but you're going to get put out next week. <laughs> so you have to impose it upon them because they'll get so spooky and so way out there, you can't dialogue with them. So you have to tell them, this is what I'm going to do. Hi. Number three, number three, third person, I'm, personality I, I could be dealing with is a socially abusive personality. This is a person because of their insecurities, inferiorities, born out of some sort of deprivation that they've been through, handle their situations with rudeness and violence and volume to intimidate others. In other words, I don't have to listen to you because I can whoop you. <laughs> I can dominate you. I don't have to listen to you. You have to listen to me. Mm. <sighs> Adjustments you have to make if that's you. If you're in the house and you like to slap folk around and you use volume because your argument is weak. Y'all seen people do that? I mean, I mean, they just start talking louder than you talk. They're not listening to you and they don't, what they're saying, what they're saying, not making any sense, but they got more volume. 
and that volume is normally a prelude to an explosion. So when they start the volume, you back off because you don't want the foolishness that follows the volume. Can I get a witness in the house? If that's you, hey, that's okay, stay with me. You put an asterisk, you put an asterisk there because I'm going to show you how to get beyond that. You came to the right church today. You watching by television, you turned on the TV at the right time today. This is your day. Thank you, Benny Hinn. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. Watch this, watch it, watch it, watch it. Come watch this, son. Here's the adjustment you need to make. First of all, you need to know who you are in Christ and learn to depend on the Holy Spirit to restrain your flesh. I'm going to show you how to do it. The approach that you have to take when you're dealing with a person who is violent like this, number one, never challenge them in public. Number two, speak softly in conflict. Proverbs 15, 1 says a kind word, soft word, turns away wrath. And number four, number, th number whatever am I, what's number four? Like, number three, under that, require defined respect. Defined respect. You have to say, this is disrespectful and I will not have it. Here is how you need to respect me. Amen? I am not your B. Don't call me that. Boy, I was not talking about boy. I was talking about you doing. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad. What was y'all's mind? Where was y'all's mind? Okay, 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 okay. Now, you have to lay some ground rules for respect. Because if you don't, if you don't lay the ground rules and enforce those ground rules, they will abuse you. Amen. It's a part of their nature. That's how they've gotten their way. Amen. Amen. Number four, number four, the complaining depressive personality. The complaining depressive personality. This is a person who has an addiction to identifying and magnifying every negative situation, every negative inner situation to justify their victim status their right to be unhappy and to sour the lives of others. This is a person you could give them a gift. And when they take the gift, then you didn't give it to me right. I saw you looking off when you gave it to me. <laughs> and then it, it looked like you wrapped this yourself. You wrapped this yourself? This kind of person, you cannot make them happy. They are bent on being unhappy. Don't get frustrated with them. That's just the way they are. No matter what you do, you can say a kind word. But you didn't say it enough. What you, what you want? You want some? That's why you said something to me nice? You want some? If by chance you're that person, Discipline yourself to cast down negative imaginations and focus on positive, on the positive in every situation and affirm it out loud. These are the corrective measures you need to make. If you're dealing with a person like this, number one, don't criticize them. Number two, always suggest solutions. Number three, don't join their pity party. And before, pray for them for because they are often under spiritual attack. Amen. Number five, how many know you got to get the CD today? How many know you got to get the CD? I guess, okay, all right, watch this. Watch this. And you got to order it too. You got to order it. Yes, you do. All right, watch this. What am I not? Number what? Oh, hold on, number five. It is the seductive, manipulative personality. This is a person who seduces you. This is a person who seeks to establish their agenda through lies, stories of hard luck and deprivation, to gain an emotional advantage over you. They are deviant, distrustful, and exploitative. Amen, amen. If I had had a dad, I wouldn't know how to be a husband, but I didn't have a daddy. <laughs> what daddy got to do with it? <sighs> they always got a hard luck story. I mean, this one guy, well, years ago, this one guy, Dr. B, and I was ministering to, and this couple, this couple, and the, the husband, he would always say, 
I just don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how to be a good man. I just, I just don't know how. I grew up in the projects. You know, had a single parent. I just don't want to. I just don't know how, Pastor. I don't know how. We got it. You know, and I, I'm doing the best, best I can. And then he, he well up. And his wife, she just melts. Oh, man, she, this boy is playing you like a fiddle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if that's you, and you know who you are, <laughs> repent without excuse. Pray for the compassion of Jesus so you can learn to care about other folk. And then trust God's ways and you will not have to manipulate others. Boy, that boy is preaching good today. That boy is preaching good today. All right, watch this. Number six, number six. Number six, oh my God, number six, is the, oh, I got eight of them. I got eight of them. I got eight of them. All right, number six is the passive, irresponsible personality. This is the person who abdicates their responsibility, seeking out others to care for them, making few demands in the relationships, easygoing, they avoid decision-making, uh, and the details of life. They're just having a good ride. Now, initially, people like these folk in relationships because they can get their way. Ladies, single ladies, I'm talking to you. Y'all normally seek this person out because he'll take you wherever you want to go. He'll do whatever you want to do. He doesn't like to make decisions. He won't make decisions. And when you marry him, he's going to let you pay all the bills. Oh, he may bring the money home, but he wants you to write all the checks. He wants you to take all care of all the details. Yeah. And that's okay for a while, but there comes a time when you want a real man. I mean, when you want a man. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. We'll edit that off the tape. But there comes a time when you want a partner, someone who's right there with you, in the war with you, and not a grown child. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. They don't want details. They don't even know how to write a check. They don't know where any of the family business is. This is the person saying, you handle it, you do it. <sighs> okay, if that's you. <laughs> all right, now, now here's what you do. Here's what, you're supposed to come to you. I'm supposed to help you. I got the help for you. Really, I got the help for you. All right, so here's, here's, here's the adjustment you need to make. You need to make, number one, equip yourself to be responsible. You can learn it. You've had a free ride all this time. But it's time now to stand up and be responsible. You can learn to take care of family business. You can learn to take care and be responsible. You can learn. You got to equip yourself. Everybody say equip yourself. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you just like you've learned how to do other things, you can learn it. All right. Number, the second adjustment you need to make is to, uh, and we're going to talk about this, access the spiritual help to embrace the resolve to be accountable. In other words, this has to be a long-term commitment. Not just to stop your mate from hollering and screaming at you now, but I'm making a commitment to be a responsible person in this relationship from now on. Ooh, it's quiet in the house. Number seven, I'm going to be through with you in just a minute. Number seven, is the controlling, oh, no, 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 I can't go to number seven. I didn't tell you how to deal with a person like this, right? Oh, no, don't let me go to number seven. All right, here's, here's what you have to do if you're in a relationship with a person like this. You must establish non-negotiable guidelines. All right? You must make tough love decisions. Impose responsibilities. And avoid pitying them. 
because that is the leverage that normally causes you to, uh, uh, to, to let them remain the way they are. You pity them. Well, if I don't, what they gonna do if I, what's it? You know, there was a guy years ago in Houston, years ago, he said, he was a pastor. He would never, never take a vacation. He would never be out of his church on Sundays and never do that. And you know what his reason was? He said, if I did, my church would go down. They can't make it without me. He died 38 years ago and the church is still going. They managed. Some of y'all will get that. Y'all, some of y'all make the connection in just a minute. Some of y'all ain't make the connection. Like, Why are you talking about that man dying? <laughs> some of y'all didn't even make the connection. All right. Yeah. They, they, look, they will manage. Amen. Number seven, the controlling perfectionist personality. This is the deviant nitpicker whose uncontrollable passion for excellence makes everyone else's life miserable. He seeks to make everyone think like and act like himself. <laughs> oh my God, quit judging, quit judging, quit judging. Normally blinded by the imperfections in others, they're incapable of discussing present situations due to their flawed sense of superiority. Amen. Now, I graduated from this because this is where I was in my earlier days. Amen. I could find something wrong in everything. And I just don't understand how you can't think like I think. I think this way. How come you can't think like this way? Got it? You know, I hid behind the thing. I want to just do it excellence, but excellent. But my whole idea was, you know, it, it was, I was a, a, a nitpicking perfectionist. I'm still a perfectionist. I'm just not a nitpicker. All right, watch this, watch this, watch this. Here's the adjustment you have to make. Here's the adjustment. Curb your zeal to make others think like and act like you. I had to finally arrive, arrive at the place. Wasn't nobody being frustrated for me because they had found out how to ignore me. <laughs> my staff, they found out how to ignore my frustration. My, my, my family, they, I was, I'm the only one all bent out of shape. <laughs> so I had to arrive at the point where, you know, they're not going to think like me because they're not me. They're not smart as me. I'm smarter than all of them. <laughs> it is my curse. No, 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 no. All right, it's just joking. Don't write me nothing about that. All right, all right, all right. All right. Second thing you have to do is respect the de developmental stages of others and help them grow. So I reformed all of that energy of complaining into teaching. I want to show you how to grow. So if you're a perfectionist, instead of being frustrated and nitpicking everybody else's deficit, then you use that as a platform to now become a teacher to help everybody else grow. Rechannel that energy. Are y'all listening to me? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Now, if you are dealing with the perfectionist controlling personality. Don't be frustrated with them. They'll get over it. Don't debate imperfections. You can't win. All right? Take full responsibility. It'll shut their mouths. My staff learned this. I take full responsibility. Say, Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> now I can't argue anymore. Y'all ready to take full? I can't argue with you. I can't, you know, I'm trying to, you know, talk about, talk about what you've done, why you've done it this way. And I say, well, I passed. I take full responsibility. Now I got to shut up. Because that's why I was trying to get you to take responsibility, but you already took it. You didn't give me a chance to vent. I needed to vent, but you went over. Ah. And here's another way to deal with this control and perfectionist. Ask them for a solution. In other words, since you're so smart, what would you do? And that's all we need is that opportunity for us to then vent a little further. <laughs> Number eight. And the last one. The acceptance needy personality. Everybody say needy. And this is, a person, this is a person who aggressively needs the acceptance of others, born out of a poor self-image, which causes them to suppress their feelings, forfeit their rights to be accepted by others and often abused. You have to 
to, here's, here's the adjustment you need to make. You need to begin to build your self-esteem through understanding the power of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Make his, that relationship the priority. Second thing you need to do if you find yourself in this, refuse to be used and abused by others' established guidelines. If you're approaching and you're, you're, if, you're, if you're dealing with someone in a relationship like this, you, might, you have to help them express their feelings because they will say they have none or they will quickly agree with your feelings. You have to help them express their feelings and don't criticize them for their feelings and applaud their initiatives. Because normally a person like this will not take initiative in anything because they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to be rejected. Look at the person and say, get the CD, get the CD. Whew. All right, now, go with me in your Bibles to James chapter 4. Now, my, 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 I agonized this week with this whole, this whole lesson. And my agony this week was, God, I mean, man, I mean, you know, I only have so much, of a, so much time to deal with this and to open up this can of worms about a person's, you know, deficits and not having the time to put it back, I mean, to, 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 to show them how in every situation to, to correct it. I mean, man, I couldn't, I couldn't see how I could do that. And then the Holy Spirit told me, that's not your job. Mm, Y'all didn't even get that. He said, helping them with their deficits is not your job. That's my job. Then I went searching through the scripture and I found it. Oh, yes. You don't need to sit down on somebody's couch and let them psychoanalyze you to get over these deficits if you find yourself on the list and you will find yourself in some greater or lesser degree on one of these lists. But that is the purpose and the role of the Holy Spirit in your life to help you. You do not have to remain the same. And his help for you is supernatural. Nobody excited but me. All right, watch this, watch this. Uh, what did I tell you, James? Ooh, amen, amen. All right. Oh, praise the Lord. All right, James chapter 4. All right, watch this. James 4. And look there in verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Underline the word humble there. All right? Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Look at verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall, what is he going to do? Come on, class, I need you to talk back to me. He will what? If I humble myself to him, he will what? He will lift me up. All right? There is, and there must be, and on purpose is out. Hunch the person next to you and say, you don't have but a few minutes, but you don't have but a few minutes, but you got to hear this. Come on, listen to this. Listen to this. There must be a, a on purpose, deliberate desire to detach yourself from these controlling negative personality deficits. There must be a desire on your part to say, I see myself here and I don't like it. No, 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 that's what I had to do one day. I saw myself, I said, no, I don't like it. Yes, this is the way I am, and I don't even like the way I handle things. It is called brokenness. Or another synonym for it is humbling yourself. It's saying, God, I give up. God, I want to change, and here's the way I am, and I want to change, and I give up. It is a place of brokenness, and when people come to that place where they give up, it is then where God steps in, and he's able to make you. Oh, my God. No, no, he's able. See, he cannot change you against your will, but once you own up to it and ask for his help, he comes in supernaturally, and he begins to reshape you from the inside. Most of the time, we look at for help from the outside. Tell me what I need to do. Give me this, give me that. But when it comes to transformation of deficits, it's something that the Holy Spirit does on the inside and he's waiting for you to say, God, I give up. That's the broken state. That's the state that happened to Moses. That's the state that, that, uh, that uh, David got in. That's the state that Paul was in. That's the state where God says, if you will do this, I will come in and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. All right. Amen. 
Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Change is the product of the perfecting of the saints by the Holy Spirit to make us fit for his use. Whoo, everybody say make us, make us. Yes, make us. He comes in and he does a work on the inside of us. I can't articulate it and explain it. I just tell you, it's the way he does. Yes, things become new. You begin to respond in a different way. You'll be able to harness your flesh. Flesh no longer runs you. Flesh no longer dominates you. You are now in control. It's a supernatural thing that the Holy Spirit does, but he waits for you to say, come in. All right, Romans, are you there? All right, watch this. Romans chapter, what I tell you? Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 12. Therefore, brother, we are debtors not to the flesh. We are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye after, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall what? Die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall what? If I through the Spirit mortify the deeds. Not through the soul, but through the Spirit. Now, if you back up there, it says, now... <clears throat> That, uh, ah, <laughs> verse 9, um, oh, verse 11 would be good. It says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell, where? In you. In you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth, where? In you. Now, I want you to get this. You got to get this. The change comes from the inside out. It is the Holy Spirit who is able to affect the change and the transformation from the inside. And, and that was, I, tell, I cannot tell you uh, the, the load that lifted off of my mind by saying I cannot minister this lesson and open up all of these, you know, wounds of, 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 of deficits and, and leave people walking out of here saying, I'm all messed up, I'm all jacked up. Yeah, that's me. Pastor talked about me, and I don't know how to change. You change by humbling yourself experiencing a brokenness and saying, God, now I see why I, things are like they are. But thank God I know I can get help because born, being born again, if you're not born again, we're going to get you born again today. And the Spirit of God's going to go on the inside of you. And because His Spirit is on the inside of you, if you ask Him to help you, He will affect change on the inside. Yeah. <sighs> go with me again. Go with me again. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We just by through. Just by through. You get blessed today. Oh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13. Everybody say, he can make me. Everybody say, Holy Spirit, make me. Yes, he will make you. He will come here and he will make you. All right, verse 20. It's going to sound somewhat like what we already read. It says, now uh, the peace of God, Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. Who make you perfect. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working where? Come on, class. In you, that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. First Peter, first Peter, first Peter 5. Everybody say, he can make me, he can make me. Yes, if I humble myself and I resist being stubborn and remaining the way I am, a supernatural power of God will affect change on the inside of me. If I humble myself, that humbling of yourself, that brokenness speaks volumes to God. It says to God that I'm ready for change. It says to Satan, you don't have me any longer. It says to others, you can count on me to restrain my flesh from here on out because I got the help of the Holy Spirit. It says to your future, I'm now accelerating on my course because I'm ready for new things. Woo! Ain't nobody happy with me. Are y'all really getting this? Oh my God, he can make you. You can be changed. Yes, you can. He's ready to affect the change on the inside of you. Verse 6, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may, desire, may, may devour. 
whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but to God, Hallelujah. but to God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After ye have suffered a while, my, 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 my. Oh, I wish I had known this years ago. I wouldn't have had to suffer as long as I've been suffering. I realized that I had issues, but I didn't know how to deal with the issues. After you have suffered a while, look what he's going to do, look what he's going to do. Make you, oh my God, he's going to get on the inside of me. He's going to make me perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I rest my case. I rest my case this morning. That no matter where you are in life, you see, I got deficits. Pastor, I got issues. You're in the right place. He did not require you to get rid of your issues to be saved. He will save you just like you are. But he loves you too much to allow you to remain the same. He says, I'm just waiting for you to say, God, I need your help. And when you reach that place of brokenness in your life, and you say, God, I need your help, it is at that moment that he steps in. It is at that moment that you become pliable clay in the potter's hand and he can begin to mold and shape you. First starts with truth. I see who I am. From truth, that's the trembling. God, I'm going to trust you. From that is the trusting. And that is when I actually do this giving up to God. From that is the transformation. The supernatural power comes to bear in my life and things that I could not stop doing on my own seems to just fall by the wayside. And from that trusting and that trembling and that, tri and, and that transformation comes the place of triumph. Now look at me. Look what the Lord has done. Now you may wonder why some folk are clapping their hands and waving their hands and rejoicing. It's because they are thinking back. They see where they are right now but they remember where they used to be. And they cannot find a scripture to say, this is what happened. All they know is somewhere along the way, somebody touched me. My, 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 my. Something happened on the inside of me. And now I am no longer the same. Whew. I'm out of time. 